Praise the Lord. Apostle Michael Rupo here again in the School of Doctrine. We have been considering the doctrine of salvation and in understanding the subject of salvation, we decided to look at it from a very boisterous and holistic perspective. And first of all, we said to understand the subject, we need to understand the trajectory of salvation. What is the pathway that God takes the believer to in order to be saved? We said God begins with judgment. In judgment, God judges the world. God judges the forces of this world, and then God separates us from the world. When God is done separating us from the world, then God begins to deal with the man from within, where he deals with the flesh. As God deals with the flesh, he takes the man into the economy of his promises. In the economy of his promises, the man interacts with the fatherhood of God. In the fatherhood of God, God relates with man in a full expression of his love, his mercies, and his faithfulness. After which God deals with the man as, a, as his Lord. In the lordship, of, of, in the lordship dealing of God with man, God brings the man from a childhood stage, from knowing him as a father, and brings him into sonship. In sonship, he takes responsibilities for the kingdom, after which the man grows to become a father. In the economy of fatherhood, for the man, he knows God experientially. It's an economy of intimacy. So we have looked at the subject of judgment, how God judged and dealt with the word. We looked at it from the Old Testament perspective and we also looked at it from the New Testament perspective. In the Old Testament perspective, we studied the lives of the patriarchs like Noah, like Abraham, and then we looked at Israel as a people. In the New Testament perspective, we looked at Jesus Christ, the pattern man, and then we also looked at the life of Paul. And in studying all of this, we discovered, for instance, looking at the life of the Israelites, God judged Egypt. God judged Egypt by killing all the firstborn sons. And the reason is because if they would not let Israel, which is the firstborn of God, go, God would take their firstborns. God also dealt with Egypt by spoiling the Egyptians, causing them to give all the heart to Israel because he gave Israel favor. And then God destroyed all the mighty men of Egypt. God judged the gods of Egypt in Exodus chapter 12 verse 12 when he came into the land of Egypt and joined the gods of Egypt. And we also saw that God, after that, separated Israel by letting them go to the Red Sea so they would never return back to Egypt on account of war. After which God began, began to deal with the flesh. And in dealing with the flesh, we saw that God dealt with every functionary that represented different part of the community of Israel. God judged Moses. God judged Aaron. God judged Miriam. God judged Korah, Nata, and Abiram. God judged the twelve spices spies that went to survey the the land of canaan god judged israel a couple of times the reason is because it reveals to us that god has zero level tolerance for flesh so when god is done dealing with flesh god brings us into the economy of his love and it's important for us to understand like we taught that flesh is actually the nature of the fallen man flesh is every form of inspiration motivation and empowerment other than god and god will ensure that flesh is dealt with and we said the way to deal with flesh is not mechanical the way to deal with flesh is by the economy of the holy spirit and this economy has different tributaries the first aspect we saw that in dealing with flesh man had to live perpetually in the presence in second thessalonians 2 verse 6 the bible said when god appears in the brightness of his glory the spirit of his mouth will consume the evil one. So we saw that flesh is dealt with when man is in the presence of God. We also saw that flesh is dealt with when man continually beholds the face of God. In 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, he said, We all with unveiled faces beholding us in the glass. The image of the Lord, we are changed. In 1 John chapter 3 verse 2, the Bible said, When God shall appear, as we see him, we shall be like him. So looking upon the Lord, beholding the Lord, tames flesh, eats of flesh, and we engineers the soul structure. And then we said, the question is, how do we behold the Lord? What picture do we look at? We said the first way to behold the Lord is by meditation and contemplation. As you meditate on the word of God and visualize the word of God in your spirit, man, you will discover that the image of the Lord is made bare. We also said we behold the Lord by joining into the waiting place in true prayer. We said waiting is not necessarily prayer, but waiting is a place in the spirit where the soul of man is quieting and man can look upon the Lord. And we said one of the things that take us there is prevailing prayers. When we break through, our soul becomes quiet. It said be anxious for nothing. 
Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God that surpasses knowledge will garrison your heart so when we pray through our souls become quiet and we focus on the Lord and we also said we can enter into that place through the economy of worship as we worship the Lord we enter into his courts and when we enter into his courts we can behold his presence and when we behold his presence flesh is destroyed and we said the third way to do it is to be filled with the Holy Ghost by chance by singing spiritual songs and making melodies in our hearts to the Lord according to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 and then we said the third way God deals with flesh is by allowing us go through circumstances that the Bible refers to as fire the fire that purges as we go through the, the circumstances what happens is that our gaze our trust is turned to the Lord he said in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 he said God humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger that you may know that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God he also said in 2nd Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8 Paul teaching now that we went through despair until we despaired of life and we learned to trust the Lord so Paul who is a faith preacher a grace preacher a kingdom preacher came to trust God because he went through circumstances that taught him how to trust the Lord and Paul's testimony will eventually become we are the circumcision Philippians 3 verse 3 that worships God in the spirit rejoicing in Christ Jesus having no confidence in the flesh so we saw that God will have to judge the flesh when God judges the flesh then the child of God comes to the place of understanding the fatherhood of God and I said the fatherhood of God is threefold the fatherhood of God is expressed through the love of God it's expressed through the faithfulness of God and it's expressed through the mercy of God the love of God impacts the nature of God the faithfulness of God impacts faith and the mercy of God preserves so we started looking at the subject of the love of God and there are two categories in dealing with the love of God the first category is the infrastructure that the love of God rests upon and there are three pillars upon which the love of God rests upon the first category of the love of God that we'll be looking at it is the infrastructure of unconditional forgiveness justification by faith and the wrath of God the second aspect of the love of God is the gifts of the father and we said the gifts of the father is what makes for a complete believer and we look we, 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 we would consider them eventually they and they, they entail the the gift of eternal life the gift of righteousness the gift of the Holy Spirit authority in Christ Jesus and all of that we'll be dealing with that as time goes on then we come into sonship in sonship we take kingdom responsibility and the way to take kingdom responsibility is by priesthood and kingship where we exercise our dominion authority or dominion mandate through our authority in kingdom legislation and finally we come to fatherhood where we know the Lord experientially he say I write unto you children because your sins have been forgiven I write unto you young men because you are strong the Word of God abides in you and you have defeated the evil one I write unto you fathers because you've known him that is from the beginning this is the trajectory of salvation and as we have been on this class so far we have studied the judgments of God we have studied dealing with flesh we've studied the first phase of the love of God where we treated forgiveness of sins justification by faith and of course we looked at the balance of the wrath of God and in dealing with forgiveness of sins we tried as much as possible to emphasize that we are not forgiven our sins because we did anything we are forgiven our sins because Jesus paid the price and our faith in the finished works of Christ is what credited forgiveness into our spirits this is what makes it the love of God because we were due for debt in Romans chapter 3 verse 23 he said for the wages of sin is debt but the gift of God is eternal life and we made it clear that God does not pardon sin God cannot pardon sin in Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 he said thou O Lord art of a purer eyes your eyes cannot behold iniquity God can never pardon sin God rather forgives sin and we said forgiveness is the word aphesis and it means freedom from sin it means purging remission cleansing so in Christ Jesus what happened is that the price the penalty of divine justice that was allotted for sin was laid on Christ he took it upon himself so in Christ we were judged and that was not enough the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed and washed off our sins so God is no longer angry with us if we look at the scriptures very quickly 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 and 21 the Bible said whoever is in Christ Jesus is a new creation 
old things are passed away behold all things have become new and in verse 21 he said for he made him that was without sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God so on the cross what happened is that God was laid on Jesus Christ everyone who therefore believes is now judged so he will no longer come to judgment this is what the Bible says and Jesus said that whoever believeth in me shall not come to judgment but has passed from death to life in Romans chapter 8 verse 1 Paul said for there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus in Christ we were judged this is the doctrine the message the gospel of Jesus and the cross first Corinthians 1 18 he said we preach Christ and him crucified so our faith in Jesus our faith on the cross is God's spiritual and intelligent balance for judging our sins everybody who believes in the cross has no sin penalty on him anymore and that does not stop there the Bible said the blood of Jesus Christ was taken to the holy tabernacles of heaven the blood is the testimony what speaks our justification and forgiveness in heaven is the testimony so when we believe in the blood the blood keeps speaking it's not the blood of Abel that speaks vengeance God is not setting traps for us to judge us God is saving the world and the blood is that testimony in heaven in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 verse 14 verse 24 and verse 28 the scriptures is replete and clear on this subject he said neither by the blood of goat and calves because that's what was done in the Old Testament the old priest would take the blood put it on the mercy seat and it covers the sin of Israel for one year but here comes the blood of the precious son of Jesus Christ he said neither by the blood of goat or calf as was done in the Old Testament but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption in verse 14 he said how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God in verse 24 the Bible says for Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands which are the figures of the true but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us I answered a question while I was dealing with this subject there are lots of people that say so should we no longer co confess our sins what is actually making the confession for us is the blood of Jesus I tell you the blood of Jesus is the one that is the testimony in God's presence concerning our sins the blood of Jesus this is what the Bible said in first John chapter 1 verse 7 if we walk in the light as he is in the light he said the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins and in verse 9 he said if we if we confess he says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness the word confess is the word homologio it means speaking in consent as God has said so confessing our sins is actually agreeing with what God has said however to create a balance I said something I said it's important for us for conscience sake if we feel if we if we if we know that only by confessing would our conscience be at peace then it's allowed in fact the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 verse from verse 18 to 22 he said I will go to my father I will tell him I'm not worthy to be your son but to be a slave and then he came to his heart and he did that but when he went to the father the father forgave him before he came because while the father saw him afar off he ran to him embraced him kissed him and placed a ring on his hand and wore him a sandal even though the boy confessed his sin the father did not forgive him because of the confession but for conscience sake the young man needed to confess so if for conscience sake you need to confess your sin it's fine Paul said holding faith and a good conscience first Timothy 1 19 which some having put away concerning faith have shipwrecked their faith so if your conscience is affected go ahead and confess that will make for you to have peace with God but for God having peace with you is predicated upon your faith in Christ Jesus this is what the Bible says in Romans chapter 4 verse 25 he said 
for he was delivered for our offense and was raised again for our justification so the deliverance is the cross and the blood for our offense so god sees the cross sees the blood and forgives us our sins because our faith is in the cross and the blood and then god justifies us because our faith is in the resurrection so in chapter 5 verse 1 it said therefore being justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ so you see god is at peace with us because of jesus christ however for conscience sake if you would need to be at peace with god by confessing beautiful go ahead and do that but make sure you don't build sin consciousness rather build edification of your soul through the revelation of what god has done for you because what god wants to do is not to keep forgiving you on and on and on what god wants to do for you is to live a life above sin and the way to live above sin is by acknowledging this truth this is why paul would say we should reckon romans chapter 6 verse 11 that we are dead with christ we should reckon acknowledge that you are dead with christ if you make these kinds of confession then you will not need to confess about immorality you will not need to confess about lying because when you reckon that you are dead with christ something happened in verse 14 it says the holy spirit takes over as we yield to the holy spirit in philemon 1 verse 6 he said that the communication of our faith become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in us so instead of confessing to god your daily thoughts confess what jesus has done and grow beyond your sin so that you can activate the power of the holy spirit because if you don't confess what jesus did if you don't acknowledge what jesus did and if you don't yield to the holy spirit you can never grow above sin but the beautiful thing is that when you do you can live above sin and the scripture will come alive in your life because he said for this cause is the son of man made manifest that he may destroy the works of the devil the question that rises is that do we continue in sin because grace abounds because many people say if we have forgiveness of sin we'll continue to sin you are not sinning because you know you have forgiveness neither are you sinning or not sinning because you don't know the only way to live above sin is to acknowledge what god has done for you is to yield to the holy spirit to carry you into that reality in romans chapter 8 verse 11 but if the spirit of him that raised up jesus from the dead dwells in you he that raised up christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal body what is he trying to say the same way jesus was dead because he took sin upon himself remember the bible said in second corinthians 5 21 that he made him that was without sin to become sin for us so the deadness of jesus was deadness because he had taken sin upon himself so the same way the body of jesus was helpless in death but was quickened by the holy spirit that's the contrast paul was making that if you will yield to the holy spirit that your body of sin that your vile body that has become a slave to immorality to lying to fornication to theft to all kinds of things the holy spirit the same way he quickened the dead body of jesus that carried the sins of the world he will quicken your mortal body so the cure to sin is not knowing whether you have forgiveness or not the cure to sin is your yieldedness to the holy spirit he is the one that quickens you above sin and that begins when you acknowledge what god has done for you when you reckon it and then you yield to the holy spirit tonight i want to add another layer to this subject because there is a slight tendency of lasciviousness yes there's a slight tendency because many don't meditate on this thing so it doesn't become life in their spirit they don't reckon it so they hear it and run away and when you hear it and run away you will walk in sin because paul said paul said that it's our acknowledging our reckoning and our yielding to the holy spirit that brings us out of sin in fact the economy is this way judgment was put on jesus so whoever is in christ is judged and declared free and then experience is put on the holy spirit so whoever yields to the holy spirit walks free so the protocol does not end just by acknowledging what jesus did for you the protocol is complete when you yield to the holy spirit but there are many who accept what jesus did for them and never yield to the holy spirit in john chapter 16 verse 13 jesus said something instructive he said i have many things to tell you 
but you cannot receive it how be it when the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all realities so everything i'm doing for you everything i'm going to be doing for you it is the holy ghost that will bring you into the experience of it so god did not bring us into lasciviousness god saved us to carry us into the experience of eternal life but the protocol is completed and then we yield to the holy spirit in order to walk in the fullness of what god has done so I want to talk about the dangers of lasciviousness the dangers of lasciviousness is our inability or on desire to yield to the holy spirit what are the dangers of lasciviousness it's one thing to accept what jesus has done for you to receive forgiveness receive justification which is free and will always be free in christ jesus but there is a tendency of lasciviousness if you refuse to yield to the government and the governance of the holy spirit this is where many fail it they know they are the righteousness of god in christ jesus they know their sins have been forgiven they know that they have justification by faith yet they cannot experience it does that mean their forgiveness is annulled no they are still forgiven does that mean their justification is annulled no they are still justified so long as their faith is in the cross in the blood and in the resurrection but how will they walk in the experience they will walk in the experience when they yield to the holy spirit if they don't then their destination is lasciviousness and what are the dangers of lasciviousness the first danger of lasciviousness is the withdrawal of the restraining power of the holy spirit never get to that point where the restraining power of the Holy Ghost is withdrawn from your life, you are in trouble. Remember, life in this realm is an opportunity for us to invest in eternity. Our destination is not in time. Our destination is in eternity with God. Don't come to that point where you cannot define your state in eternity. I'm going to do a teaching on the doctrine of the last days and i will show you some of the consequences the reward system of eternity there are dangers if the holy spirit is withdrawn in romans chapter 1 verse 28 the bible says even as they did not like to retain god in their knowledge god gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things that are not convenient so there is a point where the Holy Ghost troubles a man. You know, because you, you accepted Jesus, the Holy Ghost was credited into your spirit. And it's natural for him to counsel, to lead, to restrain you from the ways of the flesh and to bring you into the fullness of the nature of the measure of Christ. But there is a point where the Holy Ghost would continue to restrain. And if you wouldn't, his restraining power will be withdrawn. He said, because they retain not God in their knowledge. He led them. He led them to a reprobate mind where anything goes. And if you read down, you discover that they became agents of flesh. The works of the flesh became most characteristic of their lives. The seal of salvation and eternal redemption is the Holy Ghost. But He doesn't only come to seal the spirit. He came to also refine the soul so that the soul can become an expression of the person of Christ Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 Ephesians 1 13 the Bible said in whom ye also trusted after ye had the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom, all, in whom, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise so the Holy Ghost sealed your heart but he didn't only come to seal your heart he came to guide you into all truth will you follow the Holy Ghost if you wouldn't something will happen when the restraining power of the Holy Ghost is withdrawn, then Satan will come. In Acts chapter 5 verse 4, Satan came into the heart of a man. This was the community of believers. Barnabas sold land and brought the money to the apostles. He was praised and called the son of consolation. Here comes a man who would not yield to the restraining power of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost was withdrawn. The restraining power was withdrawn because he retained on God in his knowledge. He let him go to a reprobate mind and something happened. Satan filled his heart. Satan filled his heart. Acts chapter 5 verse 4. Satan filled his heart. And Peter would say to him, Brother Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? When you had the land, was it not yours? 
when you sold it was it not yours why have you let satan fill your heart this is supposed to be the chamber according to ephesians 1 13 that the holy ghost guides but the holy ghost's power of restraint have been removed satan filled his heart and something happened he fell down and died never come to that point where you refuse to yield to the holy ghost and you turn into lasciviousness and satan fills your heart in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 14 he said the love of christ constrained us how does this love constrain us? Romans 5 verse 5 is that the love of God is spread abroad in our heart by the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit is the restraining force. He restrains you in form of love. He restrains you in form of hunger. He restrains you in form of leadings. Yield to Him today. Else you will be like the swine that is washed but goes back to his vomit. The second danger of lasciviousness, which I said is born, not because you have forgiveness, not because you have justification, but because you refuse to yield to the Holy Spirit. The second danger of lasciviousness is, with, is by becoming an agent of iniquity. Iniquity is not just sin, it is a state of godlessness. And in Matthew 24 verse 14, he said, The love of many shall wax cold, because iniquity shall abound. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Remember, it is the love of God that restrains us. Second Corinthians chapter five, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse fourteen. And that love is spread abroad in our hearts by the Spirit. But because iniquity shall abound, many will turn away from the Holy Ghost. They will live on Facebook two four seven. They will live on YouTube. They will live on Instagram. They will no longer live in the Spirit. They will no longer yield to the government and the governance of the Spirit. Have you not seen that the economy of this age is deception and lust? All of that is designed to draw us from the love of God. And he said, the love of many shall work good because of iniquity. And this is what happened. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, he said, the mystery of iniquity does not work it. It is working now. The idea is that, yes, it's true that you have forgiveness in Christ because it's predicated upon your faith in the cross and in the blood. It's true that you are justified because it's predicated upon your resurrection, according to Romans 4.25. It's true that God is at peace with you, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. But you will never enter into the experience of who you are in Christ. You are supposed to be the righteousness of God. You are supposed to be the glory of God. You are supposed to be an expression of the will of the Father. But you will never be these things. And you will have the danger of not knowing God. There will be a danger of not having reward in eternity. And ultimately, there will be a danger of apostasy. There will be a danger of apostasy. What's the third danger of lasciviousness? I will round up with apostasy. The third danger of lasciviousness is that you begin to function by the economy of lust. Remember, the love of God is spread abroad in our hearts by the Spirit. Remember, it is the love of God that restrains us. But this is it. He said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world. They that love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. The love of the Father is not in them. They that love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. What is in the world? Is that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Every time we subscribe to the economy of lust, we walk under the government of Satan. In John chapter 8 verse 44, he said, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father shall ye do. When love dies, lust replaces. And when lust replaces, we journey to the place of godlessness. Iniquity becomes our reality. That is why Satan did and love the world. The love of the Father is not in them. First John chapter 2 verse 16. The love of the Father is not in them. Don't come to the point where you begin to function by the economy of lust. You will lose everything you have in God. And the fifth thing that happens is that you begin to frustrate the grace of God. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 21, Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness were by the Lord, then Christ is dead in vain. Why did he say this? He said this because in verse 20, he said, I am crucified with Christ, yet I live. The life that I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So Paul is reckoning. Paul is yielding to the Holy Spirit. So what Paul meant is that I do not attain righteousness by the works of the law. 
I attain righteousness because I am yielded. Because it's that same scripture in Romans 6, 11, where Paul was counseling us to yield to the Holy Spirit that informs Galatians 2, 20. I am yielded to the Holy Spirit. I acknowledge what God has done. I reckon what God has done. And I yield to the, so yield to the Holy Spirit to walk in that experience by faith. In Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. I'm showing you this because you can have the grace of God yet walk like a fallen man. He said, likewise, reckon ye also yourself that you are dead in Christ in sin and alive in God through Jesus Christ. In verse 14, Paul went further because he didn't stop at reckoning. Romans 6 verse 14, he said, for sin shall no longer have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law but under grace. In verse 15, Paul went further. He said, what then? Shall we sin because we are, under, because we are not under the law? He said, but under grace, he said, God forbid. What then shall we do? Know ye not that whomever you yield yourself servants to obey, the servant of him whom you are, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness, yielding to the Holy Spirit is what brings you into experiential righteousness. So that you will become a reasonable Christian. You will, God justified you, you would also justify God. God justified you in that in Christ he forgave you your sins. In that in Christ he, he declared you free and acquitted. In that in Christ his wrath was atoned for. You become a reasonable Christian by yielding to the Holy Spirit so that you will also justify God that his faith in you is not in vain. This is the walking of grace. Paul said, I beseech you brethren, Romans chapter 12 verse 1, that ye present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Present yourself, brothers and sisters, present yourself to the Holy Spirit. When the promptings of the Holy Spirit come, follow! This is the journey into meaning. This is the journey into essence. This is the journey into eternal relevance. But many stop only at the place of the finished works of Christ. They don't journey into the Holy Spirit. They don't walk with the Holy Spirit. So they can never come into all reality. And finally, is the danger of apostasy. Lasciviousness can bring you onto apostasy. What is apostasy? It's a state where you can no longer be helped of God because you have annulled your faith. You have denied your faith. You have reversed your faith. You can't believe what you believed anymore. And you need to understand the only basis for which God relates with man is the economy of faith. He said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. It is your faith in the cross and your faith in the blood that gave you remission of sin. It's your faith in the resurrection that gave you justification. Apostasy is a possibility. You come to a point where you no longer have the faith you once had. So, Paul began to emphasize from Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. He said, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of the doctrine of baptism and of the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgments. Now, all of this is what we call the enlightenment of the believer. I've done a robust teaching on this subject, I call it kingdom establishment, where you understand the significance, the spiritual undertone and significance of what those six credentials are. It's called the enlightenment of the believer. He said, and this will I do if God permits. He said, for it is impossible. This is where apostasy begins from. It's impossible for those who were once enlightened. That means those who have turned away from dead works, who have faith towards God, who have entered into the doctrines of baptism, those who have entered into the resurrection from the dead, those who have entered into the judgment of the Father, they are the enlightened ones, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, addition, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted of the good word of God, and of the power of the age to come. If they should turn away, it will be impossible to renew them again unto repentance. Why? Seeing that they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. What does that mean? It simply means that their faith have been annulled. Their faith have been made of non-effect. You know, your, your, your forgiveness, your justification are all predicated upon your faith on the cross, the blood, and the resurrection. But if you don't yield to the Holy Spirit, a point will come. A point will come where all of a sudden these things will mean nothing to you anymore. And then the guy who once believed in the Lord all of a sudden turns and said, this is nonsense. And it's not just a position of novices because you could do it out of anger, you could do it out of ignorance, you could do it out of aggression. That's not what it's saying. He's talking about people who have received the enlightenment of the Spirit, who have tasted of the good word of God, 
which is the rema, the rema, the living word of God, who have tasted of the gift, the heavenly gift, which is eternal life, who have tasted and been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, who have seen, handled the power of the age to come. He said, when these guys turn away, it's impossible to renew them. What does that mean? They did no longer yield to the convicting, the restraining, and the leadership, the government, the governance of the Holy Spirit. A point come where they became a God unto themselves and they can no longer believe in Christ. It's one of the things, the slippery ground of lasciviousness. It takes you to that point where all of a sudden nothing means anything to you anymore. And at that point, God can help you because the only basis for which God interacts with us is our faith. The Bible said without faith, it's impossible to please God. Every price that Jesus paid will be useless unless you have faith in him. Your faith in the blood, your faith in the cross, your faith in the resurrection is what defines your essence and meaning in Christianity. But unfortunately in apostasy, all of this faith is reversed, is made of non-effect. Suddenly you don't have them anymore because you allowed lasciviousness and the deceptive power of sin brings you to a point where your soul is eroded and you can no longer yield to God. These are the dangers of lasciviousness. So what are we expected to do to guide our heart? The Bible said in Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23, it said, guide your heart with all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. If you don't guide your heart, there are many reasons that will make for lasciviousness. And I want to give you a few of them very quickly. One, the first reason for, the, for, for lasciviousness to find expression in the man's life is the absence of guidance. Many never come under spiritual authority. So they are they live recklessly, they live on their own, they do what they think is right and what's not right. In this kingdom, you must be traced to a man. You must be traced to a man. Paul will say to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he said, The things you've learned of me before many witnesses, the same commit to other men, faithful men, who shall be able to teach others. So Paul, first generation, Timothy, second generation, faithful men, third generation, others, fourth generation. The things you've learned from me in the presence of, in the presence of many. Commit to other faithful men who shall be able to teach others. So there is a chain of command. Therefore, when lasciviousness is to set in, there will be guidance that can preserve the integrity and the heritage of God. But unfortunately, our generation is a generation of rebellious people. Nobody submits other authority. And when the devil attacks, we become a cheap tree. Even in scripture, you will see it very clearly. The devil came for Peter and Jesus will say, Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to have you. To sift you like wheat, what I have prayed for you, that your faith faileth not. When thou art recovered, strengthen thy brethren. Luke 22, 31. Strengthen thy brethren. So a man must be there to stand for you, else there will be a problem. In Jude chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, the Bible began to show us how men drift into lasciviousness. How men spira into lasciviousness. Jude 1, verse 3 and 4. You would see the, 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 the seductive nature of drifting men into lasciviousness. You say, Beloved, when I give diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto us. Why? Why contend for the faith? Now, that's a guardian trying to preserve the heritage of God on another. He said, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord and denying the Lord Jesus our Lord. Why? Evil men crept in because the guidance were not there. In Acts chapter 20 verse 28, Paul said something very instructive, very beautiful and very instructive. What did Paul say? Acts chapter 20 verse 28, Paul was admonishing the elders of the church of Ephesus because he was going to leave them and he said take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock now this is the guardian talking to the leaders he has raised and commending them to take care of the flocks take heed therefore unto yourself and to all the flock over which the holy ghost have made thee overseers so every man in this kingdom will have a measure of overseeing on his life to feed the church of god which he had purchased with his own blood the responsibility of guardianship. In verse 32, Paul made a very striking statement. He said, therefore, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to keep you and to preserve you and give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. So it was Paul's duty to keep the elders 
of Ephesus. And it was the eldership's duty to keep the flock in Ephesus. This is guardianship. If there is no submission to authority or the allowance of authority to, to be exercised over our lives, lasciviousness will not be far-fetched. The second reason for lasciviousness is refusal to yield to the Holy Spirit. Like we've said already in Romans chapter 6 from verse 11 to 14, the Bible made it clear unto us. Refusal to yield to the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 1 verse 28, Romans 1 28, it said because they refused to retain God in their knowledge, he gave them to a reprobate mind where anything goes. So if you don't yield to the Holy Spirit, you will yield to another spirit. And that is why he said, love not the world. They that love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. What's in the world? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. So if you don't align with the one that shared the, the, the love of God abroad in your heart, then another spirit will come and share the, the lust of this world in your heart. In John chapter 16 verse 13, Jesus said, I have many things to give you, to share you, to share with you, to say unto you, but you cannot receive it. How be it when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into our reality. So a man who is drifting away is a man who has refused to follow the Holy Spirit. He said, I saw through my window a young man void of understanding. He has taken the part of death, for he went the way of the adulterous woman. And the woman said unto him, Come. Let us enjoy ourselves. Let us have of our pleasure. For I have dressed my bed with rubies. And the good man of the house have embarked on a distant journey. Why? He is without leadership. The Holy Ghost is no longer leading him. So he's led of his lust. He's led of his flesh. He's led of the, the powers and the princes of darkness. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2, the Bible shows us the people that are not led by the Holy Spirit. He said they are controlled, the sons of rebellion. They are controlled by the prince of the power of the air. If you don't submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you must become lascivious. It's only a matter of time. The third reason for lasciviousness is the refusal to retain the knowledge of God in our spirits. The refusal. You must make a constant practice to keep the word of God in your spirit. Romans 1 28 comes again handy. He said, because they retain not God in their knowledge, he gave them to a reprobate mind where anything goes. Verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceitful, mal malignity, whisperers, vampires, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmeasured, that they which commit these things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in making others do it. When you don't retain the, the knowledge of God in your mind, this is your destination. This is why Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, 13 and 15, he said, until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, give thyself wholly to these things, then thy profiting will be made manifest to all. Give thyself wholly to these things. If you don't retain the knowledge of God in your mind, the life of God, the power of God, the governance of the spirit can never find expression in your life. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 20, he said, My son, attend to my words. Give thy ears to my saying. Let them not depart from thy eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. He said, guard your heart with all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. In Psalm 1 verse 1 to 6, the Bible was reiterated these same factors. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the path of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor is seated in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And on this law doth he meditate day and night. He is like the tree that is planted by the rivers of living waters, whose leaves never wither. He said, but the ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff that the wind blow away. He said, the ungodly shall not stand in the congregation of the righteous, neither sinners in the judgment. Oh my God, we need to retain the knowledge of God in our hearts. The Bible said in Psalm 119 verse 9 and 11, How then shall a young man keep his ways? This is a prince talking. This is a monarch talking. He has seen all the lust and pleasures of this life. He said, How shall a young man keep his ways? By taking heed unto thy word. Thy word have I put in my heart that I may never sin against you. There is a word that must be in your heart for you to stand firm in this corrupt and lustful generation. This is why we must retain the knowledge of God in our minds. And finally, what makes for lasciviousness is misinterpretation of truth. Jude chapter 1 verse 4. There are certain men crept in unawares 
who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God unto lasciviousness and denying the Lord Jesus. So there are men who can misinterpret truth because they are laden with all kinds of lust and they bring a generation into bondage. This is why it says, be no longer tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine because there will be many winds of doctrine. There will be many contrary winds of doctrine that will be designed to turn you to lasciviousness. But thanks be to God, there are guidance in this kingdom. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 30, the Bible, Paul, at the same time, admonishing the elders of Israel, he said, also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. So there are many that will arise to speak perverse, perverse things in order to draw disciples unto themselves. In Galatians chapter 3, chapter 1 from verse 5 and 6, Paul also emphasized the same. Men who come to change the grace of God, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ, unto another gospel. So lasciviousness is sponsored when men, when men open up their spirits and their hearts to strange doctrines. Everything that makes you live carelessly and makes it easy for you to sin and not to accept and fear and tremble the judgments of God is not of God. I said it before, there is no grace gospel that cannot be explained in light of the book of Revelation. Any grace gospel that cannot be explained in light of the eternal judgments of God is wrong. So every gospel you hear that takes away the fear of God from your heart will take you onto lasciviousness. Never allow misinterpretation of truth. The, the workings of God's spirit in our hearts is to corroborate the verdicts of God upon our lives on account of the finished works of Christ. We must make sure that we stand strong in the faith. Tonight I pray that the Holy Spirit will not only come upon you strongly, but the convicting and the restraining power of the Spirit will begin to govern your heart and to bring you to that place of green pasture where you are nurtured by the eternal powers of God. I pray that the Lord's Spirit will lead you. I pray that the Lord's Spirit will preserve you. I pray that the Lord's Spirit will guide you and to keep you within the perimeter and the confines of the fear of God so that in reverence we will serve God and walk in wisdom that is eternal. May the deception of this age that causes men to walk in lasciviousness, in lust and in godlessness not be within the borders of your soul. But may your soul be kept, preserved, and guarded by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that the Lord give you wisdom to yield to the Holy Spirit today. And I pray that the Lord gives you inner ability to stand and to walk in light. So that the life and the power of God becomes the operational economy in your life. See you in the next class. I'm Apostle Michael Oropo. And this is the School of Doctrine. God bless you.